speakers mic'd. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce the panel. Um, this discussion we, we've entitled Internet Freedom's Next Frontiers. Frontiers is a question mark. And I have uh, uh, Omid Memarian, and am I pronouncing that correctly? Memarian? Uh, is an Iranian journalist. He's a contributor to the Huffington Post and the Daily Beast. Uh, I think he can uh, relate perhaps uh, quite well to uh, Yoani's story. Uh, he, is, uh, he started a, bl a blog in, in Iran uh, early last decade and has been in this country for a number of years, and we'll hear more about his story. Uh, suffice it to say that he has uh, received the Human Rights Defender Award for his work. He's been a visiting scholar at UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism. And uh, next on our panel discussion is Mary Jo Porter. Mary Jo is the co-founder, well, first of all, Mary Jo is one of the people who allows Ioanni's voice to be uh, amplified and heard around the world. Mary Jo is, translates and has organized other translators for Cuban bloggers, but she uh, translated uh, Ioanni's book and continues to translate her, her blog. Um, she's co the co-founder of emosoido.com and translatingcuba.com as part of this endeavor. Um, also, I, I added this because I saw it in the book. It, this wasn't on my, my cheat sheet, but uh, Mary Jo's day job is, is a transportation consultant. And uh, that would have been very apropos if I had gotten away with the title I wanted for this event. <laughs> Don't make a face, Faith. Uh, I, I first, when we were conceiving of this, I thought the title should be The Road from Tunis to Pyongyang Goes Through Damascus. So that would have... I, I that, public transit on that, that. You, you could have helped us out. But, <laughs> Cool, cooler minds prevailed and uh, pithier minds, and so that's not the title for today. Um, and third, we have Marcus Nolan joining this discussion. Marcus is the deputy director at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. His work covers political economy of U.S. trade policy and Asia. He is uh, the author of Witness to Transformation, Refugee Insights into North Korea, and Arab Economies in a Changing World. So I guess I can... Uh, take my place here. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about this conversation, not just because I, I get to be a part of it, but um, you know, we've had a lot of discussion this year about the Arab Spring uh, and what it led to in, in terms of what we're seeing now in Syria. And it's been a very Middle East uh, focused discussion. Uh, so this is an opportunity to kind of branch out and look at sort of as we describe it, the next frontiers of internet freedom, and in some way too, the story of last year. Um, you know, before we had Tunisia and uh, what happened in Egypt, we had a lot of uh, commotion around the Green Revolution and excitement about what social media uh, had, uh, the mobilization that occurred in Iran. So I'm glad that we can also revisit that. Uh, mindful, however, of the caution that we've received to treat each country differently. I can't imagine, this is a very disparate group of countries that we're talking about, North Korea, Cuba, Iran. Uh, it brings to mind Dilbert. I, had, I wish I had it uh, with me, but years ago, one of my favorite Dilbert cartoons uh, was, was a shot of the office that Dilbert works in, you know, the cartoon of the office worker. And it said basically in any office there are three groupings. There are the people who are in the loop. There are the people who know there's a loop but they're not in it. <laughs> and then Dilbert, of course, is oblivious to the fact that there is a loop. So you all know which country you're here to, uh, to represent in that, in that spectrum. Uh, but Omid, maybe we should begin uh, with Iran uh, in terms of discussing, uh, you know, now with, with the benefit of hindsight in terms of the contested election, the mobilization that occurred uh, in our uh, ADD fashion here in the States where we pay attention to stories like that for you know, 15 minutes, if that, and then move on to the next thing. Uh, why don't you share with us a little bit the perspective of how you see that moment in retrospect and how do people in Iran view what's happened this year? Uh, Elsewhere in, in the world and, and in terms of their own experience. And well, um, I think the internet significant role uh, two years ago in Iran. And uh, I can uh, say that if it was not for the internet, many more people would have been killed uh, in the streets of Tehran. It's, it's, it's obvious. But it's, uh, as uh, uh, the other speakers uh, uh, talked about, it was not just because of the internet. 
uh, Iran has a very vibrant civil society, academia, a very, uh, a very alive, uh, 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 is, one of, is one of the uh, youngest countries in the Middle East. So uh, people are dissatisfied and they, they don't uh, like some, some of the uh, policies of the government. So uh, it was not just uh, for the internet and Facebook and YouTube that you know, it happened, but it really helped the people to mobilize and come to the streets. And more than anything else, uh, uh, the Iranian government has a huge propaganda machine. And this is something that in the United States uh, people do not get it. Uh, and in this war, and, 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 and they are in, in, a, in a propaganda war with the, U, the, with the US. And in this war, the Iranian government has the upper hand. They are much better than the US when it comes to propaganda. And uh, it was for the, inter, uh, for the internet that uh, the Iranian people were able to challenge the narrative of the government over the events. So they create a message and they try to dom uh, make it dominant. And uh, we hear that message. It was the internet that told the world that the Iranian people want something else and we, we saw a different image of what exactly people were doing inside the country. In, in terms of my reference to Dilbert and, and being in the loop, I was struck in your, the piece that Omid wrote, wrote a nice piece for our Slate package and you mentioned that internet penetration in Iran is 38%, which of course would be quite different from uh, Cuba and North Korea. Right. Uh, you also write that uh, a lot of what the U.S. can do, and this was something that was referred to in earlier discussions, in terms of promoting connected con connectivity and internet freedom uh, can backfire. Um, at the same time, you also suggest that we're not doing enough in the, in the article, so I'm wondering is it a question of, is this sort of the Powell doctrine of internet freedom? If the U.S. is going to do something, it should be all in, as opposed to just dipping its toe in the water and playing with activists who there, therefore will be, thereby might be stigmatized, as Jacob mentioned earlier. Well, I, if you ask me this, you know, I think you know, we, um, when it comes to Iran in Washington, we do not have a, a, a solid policy. You know, I think when it comes when it uh, about uh, Libya, you know, the, it, I think uh, everybody was on the same page, you know, t uh, on what to do with Libya or many other countries or Syria. But when it comes with, uh, to Iran, you know, we don't have a solid policy. In Washington, we have like 200 different views on how to, what to do with, with Iran, and uh, we have a, a failed policy of regime change that the U.S. has uh, different administrations have uh, practiced like over the past three decades, and they have spent uh, millions of, if not billions, of dollars on this and this uh, policy and you know and they um, when, it, but, 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 but when it comes to the internet and you know how to help Iranians to challenge the narrative of the government and you know come to the streets and uh, change the government we see for example the money the US government has allocated to some of these programs is like two million dollars it's uh, it's so simplistic that you know you, you two million dollars you, you want you want to fight with the Iranian government that has spent like uh, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, uh, in, in this um, area, like um, the, the money that they spend uh, for censorship and monitoring and interception and all that is, uh, like, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's more than uh, it, it, uh, hundred, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a lot. So we have information that it's, uh, uh, like the Iranian government is working on a national uh, internet network that costs them uh, $1.5 billion. And so, and then you know, we are uh, having a, the, the U.S. administration, the, the Obama administration, is allocating two million dollars uh, for Global Freedom Act or whatever program they have. And uh, I think it's, that's a wonderful pro project, uh, internet in, in, in a suitcase. But uh, two million dollars, you know, it's it's not serious, really. It's, uh, I don't think it's really serious. We're going to get to that later okay. today. But uh, I hear you, uh, Marcus. Let's let's uh, look o look over to North Korea. Uh, I the country that I would nominate for being the one that's, uh, at least in terms of civil society and the North Korean populace, uh, is un unfortunately the, I mean, talk about the island of the disconnected. As you My reaction was if Cuba's the island of the disconnected, then North Korea's the dark side of the moon. Right? <laughs> <Just> <laughs> different planet. So when, when, when you think about internet freedom in the North Korean context, does that have any resonance? What does it mean? Are we still in the stages of trying to uh, puncture the curtain that is surrounding that country via cassettes coming in and out? Is there anything that we could speak of in terms of internet freedom? And also I want to hear your thoughts on the fact that while the populace is not quite on the global grid, uh, mm -hmm. as you pointed out in an exchange that we had, the government is, literally. 
Right. So basically, the situation in North Korea is that the government has prioritized uh, political control over any other goal or value, economic development or anything else. So internally, uh, there is essentially no internet freedom. The themes that we've been talking about are there, but the technologies are different. And then externally, they're actually quite aggressive, and, and I would be happy to, to elaborate on that. But on the internet itself, it, it basically doesn't exist. First of all, just from a hardware standpoint, North Korea has very limited uh, telecommunication links to the outside world. So there's not a lot of capacity for moving data. Uh, secondly, uh, what capacity there is is tightly controlled. So, for example, if you were somebody, if, if I was sort of my equivalent in North Korea, I was the you know, vice president of uh, Economics Research Institute in North Korea, um, I might have um, some permission to access the internet. And the way it would work probably for a guy at that level is that if I had a scientific or research reason for wanting to get some sort of foreign, you know, he wanted to read an article by Marcus Noland, then what he would do is actually apply to download the article. And somebody would screen the request. And then if, you know, it was accepted, then you'd be allowed to download the article. Um, there's a very, 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 very small number of people who have access or, or unimpeded access to the World Wide Web. That's tiny. The themes are there, but the technology is different. North Korea has only really gotten cell phones in the last few years. Uh, there are multiple uh, networks, but the one that's important numerically is there is now a network that um, has, it's claimed to have half a million subscribers. It's operated as a joint venture between the North Korean government and the Egyptian firm Roscom. It's mainly you know, well-to-do emerging middle-class people in the capital city of Pyongyang. They can't use the phones to talk to foreigners. They can't make international calls or receive international calls, but they can talk to each other. Then in the- Can they text? Yeah, they can text. So you have at least some technology there for social communication. Then in the border region, there are cell phones, which are illegal, uh, which operate off the Chinese network. And those people can actually call abroad and receive calls from abroad. And that network on the Chinese border, I believe, is becoming an important avenue for information coming into the country. Uh, and then beyond that, there are issues. You have uh, people now talking about attempting to use technologies to essentially radio in information that would be receivable on the cell phones, uh, sending balloons in that would have flash drives, that would have the Encyclopedia Britannica. And, you know, the Slate Archive and, and whatever else, you know, people to read. But it, we're, at a point with North, we're, we're, we're at a point with North Korea where basically the tragedy of North Korea is that the government is almost entirely unaccountable to the people. And it has an almost untrammeled capacity for inflicting misery. So what we're, we're at a stage of simply trying to get information not propaganda, not even highly political information, just information to people to allow them to start to try to put some pressure to achieve greater degree of accountability on this government. Are they getting, is the regime in North Korea getting any prompts, tutoring from Beijing as to how to do this, that's to say it's better to have the sort of authoritarian network, networking that Rebecca described to get people, uh, partly for the propaganda value of disseminating nationalist messages, but also perhaps to just sort of blow off some steam? Or is there not any of that pressure coming in from China? They, they cooperate with the Chinese on issues like this. And one thing I didn't mention is that they have a, a national intranet or multiple mm -hmm. intranets. So there are people who can go to um, you know, an internet cafe in, in Pyongyang and get onto this domestic intranet and look at the highly you know, censored local websites. So the, the, there is that. They are, they are cooperating with the Chinese in that regard. But in another regard that they're cooperating with the Chinese is, I, I think, much more disturbing. Uh, while the North Korean government is very repressive and very controlling when it comes to its own people, it's very aggressive in terms of, of its external behavior. The estimates vary a lot, as does most everything with North Korea. But they appear to have an organized, militarized uh, group basically operating through what is the, kind of the equivalent of the North Korean CIA, whose job it is to attack other people. 
recently they were involved in uh, denial of service attacks against a variety of institutions in South Korea. The, I, the, the ironic one was they appear to have brought down the financial arm of the South Korean Agricultural Cooperative Organization at the same time they were asking for food aid. Um, <laughs> they have, um, they have a, a, a McAfee put out a report last week on this. I put a blog post up on my own blog uh, t this morning, has a link to that report, you can read it. The report is a bit circumspect about North Korean government involvement, but the lead author in his subsequent interviews has been quite explicit. And these attacks are not limited to South Korea. Basically, every think tank or organization in the United States that is at all critical of North Korea, or individual researchers who are doing research on North Korea have been attacked, including my institute, my collaborators, and so on. FBI is treating this as foreign espionage. Uh, they operate out of China, uh, and there's some, there's some ambiguity about <laughs> whether it's Chinese or North Korean, but in some cases it appears to be quite clearly North Koreans operating out of China. Uh, Mary Jo, you're helping to connect the island of the disconnected, <laughs> as Yuani put it. Um, tell us a little bit, I was asking you earlier, um, when, you, when you first arrived, about how many people in Cuba would read Yuani's blog. Um, she's able... Her access seems to be intermittent, but she's able to carry on, as she said in the video. Uh, but how much of a domestic audience does she have? And your answer to this was, was rather interesting. Well, first the important thing, first, the first thing is I don't speak for Ioanni, I don't speak for the bloggers, I'm not a Cuba expert, I'm just sort of in the trenches translating these blogs, so take it for what it's worth. Um, but Ioanni herself does not manage her blog, for all of those of you who blog, you know, you go onto a website and you've got WordPress or bloggers and you load your posts. She can't do this from Cuba. And she emails, generally she emails her entries out to friends abroad who post them for her. The translators, it's, it's now translated into about 20 languages, um, pick them up off of, uh, directly off the website and translate it and they all have the passwords to their language. Um, and often she can't get on the internet, even literally for like a week at a time. Sometimes she makes little um, JPEG images and attaches them to text messages and sends out her entries that way. And sometimes she literally simply uh, telephones them out, the people who help her call her at home, and she dictates the entries. In and she used to pretend to be a tourist, right? I love the story. Oh, yeah. She, um, her, her second language is uh, oh. German, and um, she's very you know, Spanish looking, she's not just sort of this obvious Cuban type that, you know, couldn't get away with anything. And she would go into the tourist hotels, which when I was there in 2008, Cubans were not even allowed to enter the hotels. And these were the only sites in the country that had internet access. Um, unless you were a government official or a doctor or somebody, you couldn't have internet at home, only foreigners could. Um, and she would go into these internet cafes and speak the sort of hodgepodge of German and then she would try to put in a few English words rather than Spanish words because her accent would give her away and somehow negotiate her way, you know, to getting a um, time on the internet. But the average monthly wage in Cuba is less than $20 a month and an hour of internet time in one of these cafes is 8 to $12. Uh, and it's dial-up speeds and when I was there, you can imagine coming from, you know, broadband and you're just kind of like, what? <laughs> Um, and there were no cell phones. when I, I saw one person on a cell phone uh, in the entire time that I was there. They were legalized after I left in 2008. Cubans have them, but they can't afford to talk on them, and they can't even really afford to text on them. Um, and they use Twitter mostly when they are able to get online uh, to send a text cost a dollar. Uh, so you can imagine you're not going to be doing a lot of twitting at a dollar, mm -hmm. tweeting at a dollar a text, but back to your, how many people, no, so, how do so people, so basically the, the blog gets, how many people, the basically, loaded the way up the, outside the country and then, right, basically the way the government controls um, access, obviously, is through just that there isn't any, that it's dial up, that it's really expensive, but what Cuba has going for it, of course, is the two million Cubans that live abroad, um, a huge portion of which live in the United States and obviously, um, great numbers in Spain and in other Latin American countries. But Ioanni's blog is read by these people 
who then email it back to their families and friends in Cuba who get on from time to time. It really is very low internet access. And then also it's brought into the country on uh, CDs. Uh, anytime we know someone reliable that's going, we'll put the entire blog forever and all the other you know, 30 blogs or so that there are now, we'll put them on flash drives. And flash drives are becoming you know, very popular. Obviously they're reusable and they're small and, and it gets passed around on flash drives, gets passed around on CDs um, until Quite recently, Joani was basically unknown in Cuba. And then very recently, the government put together an hour-long television show about how evil she is and how she works for the CIA. So now she is much better known, thanks to that. <laughs> Omid, tell us a little bit about your experience in terms of how you got started in Iran blogging, and, and how did you get in trouble? What trouble? <laughs> Well, um, I started blogging in 2002, and I, I was working as a journalist in Tehran. And uh, at a time, uh, so um, first of all, we learn how to censor ourselves. Uh, there are laws that you, you cannot talk about uh, certain topics. And uh, like the Revolutionary Guards, like the Supreme Leader, like uh, we cannot criticize the uh, religious figures and, and all that. And uh, Second is the, edit, edit, the um, our editors. They uh, tell us not to what to not to write and what to write. And third is you know the, the journalists uh, themselves. You know they know what might put them in, in trouble. So in 2002, uh, uh, I had many uh, um, uh, like I, 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 for example, imagine you know, I write a story and my editor says you know I c we cannot publish this or they wanted to publish that uh, uh, well, half of that. So. Um, uh, the blogger was introduced to the Iranian society, like I think a, a year or, or two years before that. And uh, so I was introduced to the blogger, and I uh, established my blog, and I put uh, some of my stories uh, that I could not publish in the newspaper on my blog. Or some of the stories that they published, like 50% of the story was published, or 75% of the story. So I put the entire story on the blog and say, no, this is the complete version of the story at this link. So in uh, two years, uh, um, um, I was... Uh, like a year after, I was arrested uh, by the Iranian authorities, and I was uh, I was welcomed uh, at the Iranian prison, Ebin, the, the notorious Ebin. And uh, it was funny at the time; they didn't know. I remember that they asked me, you know, "Why? How, how did you send your? Why did you uh, send your information to these all these websites, like anti-regime websites?" And I said, "I didn't send it. You know, they just, they just linked to my website. They just linked." <laughs> And it was very hard for the guy to understand, the my interrogator, to understand what, it, what was the linking, linking was there. <laughs> and you know, I, I understood that after like half an hour, one hour, I was under pressure and I said, oh, the, the problem is you don't understand linking. So I said, you know, listen, I understood. I faxed. I, every day I faxed my articles because I understood <laughs> that, you know, he couldn't understand link, but he could understand what, what, what the fax was. So, uh, so I was relieved. And, uh, but the thing is, you know, they have, um, Thanks to, uh, to, European con uh, to European companies and American companies, uh, mainly European countries and uh, companies, Chinese companies, the Iranian government has uh, advanced. You know, my, my friends who have been arrested over the past two years, they say that the interrogators are much more advanced. They, they have a lot of information. They are really like, they, some of them blog. And um, so um, the situa ha situation has changed a lot uh, over the past few years. And they are getting, like, they, they are going after China. They are the second. Uh, country, I think, after China in uh, um, developing the infrastructure, uh, you know, on one side, and also on the other side to monitor the system. However, it's it's very different than North Korea and, and 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 Cuba. In Iran, for example, we have a lot of prisoners, but these prisoners, for example, write uh, letters from the prison, and a day after, we see uh, those letters uh, letters from a prison on different websites, like many websites. So we have that kind of uh, flexibility too. Right. I, I, I want to mention that one of the one of the uh, efforts that Johnny was involved in was was creating a, a shared blog among the political prisoners who were blogging from prison, um, and I can say it now because Thank they've you. been released and he's out of the country. But it started with a blogger whose wife was the doctor in the town where the prison was, and mm -hmm. basically she was, um, you know, the patients uh, the, the guards would bribe her. They would give her husband, you know, their cell phone if he, she would treat their wife or their kid or something. And so they went through the prison and they took out all, all they removed all technology from the prison, uh, you know, because they were so angry about this blog that was coming out of the country. And, and the bloggers blogged that afternoon. And that time we posted 
the um, recording of the telephone call. So it would be totally clear that this blog had come wow. out that same afternoon that all technology had been, right. had been removed. I have a lot of uh, previous panel comments uh, streaming through my mind in terms of putting this in perspective. You know, we heard early on that in Tunisia, one of the dilemmas that the regime faced was whether or not to pull the plug on Facebook because everybody was already on there, which again is a reminder that, you know, these diff authoritarian regimes are in very different stages on this, on this uh, spectrum. We also heard uh, Assistant Secretary Posner talk about the cat and mouse game that's uh, played out between uh, civil society and the regimes, and you've pointed out that in Iran the regime has gotten quite uh, sophisticated, uh, as, as is the case in North Korea. But when we think about, again, coming back to the question of what can we do, and we can mean uh, think tanks, uh, civil society in the West, but collectively it also means Uncle Sam, the U.S. government. How can we engage in this cat and mouse game without it being counterproductive? You've touched a little bit of, on this, Omid. I want to get your thoughts as well, Marcus. Uh, first of all, Mary Jo, you, you deal with uh, these Cuban bloggers. We have this case in the news of Alan Gross, who's a USAID subcontractor, uh, who's now serving a 15-year jail term in Cuba, reportedly for handing out satellite phones to civil society groups. Uh, when you talk to bloggers like Yuani or when she writes, and what's the discourse like in that community about the desirability of having people in Washington parachute telecom equipment. We're not at the point where people are on Facebook. We don't have a Google technician, as there was in Egypt, to stand up and, and lead this movement because Cuba is so far behind. And uh, let me back up just a second and then come back to this because one of the first comments by the blogger, uh, a blogger on this, Claudia Cadello, a fantastic young, young woman blogger, was really ridicule. Um, and what had leaked out was a video of a session like this where a uh, government technician was describing to government officials what a link is, what a blog is, what all these things were. And you could just, and this is a very recent video that just leaked out. And you could see how, how incredibly ignorant they are about all this technology. And he described this internet in a suitcase that is being brought in by the CIA. And, and it just you know, sets up, and, there's, and it's all over Havana, and there's Wi-Fi you know, everywhere. And people can just, you know, open their computers. And this young blogger was like, boy, we're out there in the streets, you know, with our computers going where, 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 because, because this internet doesn't exist. Um, it's a small blogging community, but it, with very diverse opinions. And again, I don't want to speak for them. I think they probably have different opinions about um, that case. Uh, there's been a big legal analysis about it from some of the bloggers who are lawyers and, and you know, the sense that, uh, Alan Gross has been very unfairly treated uh, individually. And, um, but the idea that the, the main thing that Fidel Castro has used to support his regime over all these 52 years now is his opposition to the USA. Uh, that is his reason for being. And the main way that the bloggers are tarred uh, is that they all work for the CIA, that they are mercenaries, that they get big checks, and that they work for the CIA. And I think it's, there's a real question. I think the idea of surreptitiously trying to sneak in uh, this internet in a suitcase to these bloggers as a help is really an invitation for them to go to prison, and certainly, obviously, for the people that sneak it into them. And recently, this television series that um, it's called the, the uh, War on Cuba, um, and it's really about the internet war on Cuba, featured a, um, someone who had infiltrated the opposition community and been so effective as being their external spokesman that he was the one who was awarded the internet in a suitcase. Um, so they, you know, have him with it on his porch and, you know, all this stuff. And, and so they were able to prove, essentially, that, you know, by this by this suitcase that he had uh, on his balcony that, you know, the CIA is in charge of all the Cuban opposition. You shouldn't believe anything they say. They're all government agents for, th for the U.S. Um, internet access is a huge problem. 
There is recently a cable has come from Venezuela. It's not quite been, quote, hooked up yet. But I think the blogger's response to the cable is most instructive, which is they're not going to let us on it. It's going to be very restricted. It's going to be, and then it's kind of like, ha, ha, ha. Like, we will be on it. We will find our way onto that cable just like we find our way uh, onto the internet. One of the, uh, other than going to these internet hotels, one of the main ways to get on the internet in Cuba <coughs> is you buy the telephone call-in number of someone who is authorized to have internet and you buy an hour of time and you have their password and boy, you don't get on one second too early and you don't get off one second too late and there's a huge amount of internet access and there will be for the, for the cable and the so, broadband. So you don't feel that there's wide, necessarily widespread demand on the part of Cuban bloggers and NGOs. I think there's have, huge Well, to have Uncle Sam deliver I don't, I mean, equipment. I would ask them to it's speak for common. themselves. Okay. I, but Fair enough. The, but it I, has been proposed by the bloggers that all of the embassies, for example, set up huge Wi-Fi networks on their roofs. Go ahead, do it, so that we can sit outside and... Good idea. We've got some contacts here <laughs> in, the, in the State Department. <laughs> the, uh, also, I wanted to reference back to Amit's point about the scale of these programs and how we in Washington talk about millions of dollars and sometimes that's dwarfed in comparison to what the regimes are doing on this question of the USAID program as many of you in the audience probably know there's been a, a big uh, struggle uh, between uh, Senator John Kerry and USAID about the funding of the program vis-a-vis -vis Cuba whether it should be 20 million dollars or 15 million dollars and Senator Kerry has a lot of concerns about whether this is counterproductive along the lines that we've been talking about. And he actually really wanted to be here today to talk about that, but he had a, a prior commitment with the Dalai Lama. So <laughs> speaking of uh, powerful, independent voices, uh, Marcus, uh, help us out here in terms of the desirability or not of having the US play a role in trying to connect these societies online. When we look back at you know, previous history, particularly the fall of the Berlin Wall and, and even perhaps efforts to infiltrate uh, you know, Nazi Germany and so forth, I think we, we kind of romanticize these efforts. But what's, how do well, you see it today? Well, listening to the discussion, two thoughts occur to me. First of all, the equivalent of the, the Google man in Egypt. Um, if the North Korean regime has a vulnerability at this point, it's that Roscom managed cell phone network. And it is interesting to me that it's managed by Roscom. And I would, I mean, talk about wanting to be a fly on the wall to hear the conversations between <laughs> the Egyptian uh, cell phone operators and the North Korean government. The North Koreans have reported virtually nothing uh, about what's happened in the Middle East or in Iran uh, through their official news agencies. And indeed, are leaving their people stranded in places like Libya because they don't know what to do with them if they bring them home. In terms of our activities, you mentioned in your introduction that uh, I had recently published a book based on refugee interviews. And there is a chart in that book, which I call the Bill Clinton chart. It's a chart that shows, um, we asked, the, re we asked them the following questions. When you were in North Korea, did you have access to foreign news media? Did you consume foreign news media? And this is, this is mainly radio. And then we plot out by the year they left North Korea to in effect get a kind of panel. So the chart goes of did you have access goes like this. The chart of did you consume starts out much lower. There are people who were smoking but not inhaling. <laughs> <laughs> but then by the most recent period, those two lines have come together. The inhibition on consumption has disappeared. And what we find when we analyze the data is that people who consume foreign media uh, are more likely to disbelieve the regime's meta-narrative that all their problems are due to hostile foreign forces. Um, and it's also associated with a, a, another, a whole set of behaviors involving market activity and communicating with peers. So I would say for us, I mean, again, our technology in North Korea is just, we're just a few generations behind, just radio. Right now we have Radio Free Asia. It broadcasts uh, a limited number of hours and on frequencies that it's, it's relatively difficult for them to get. I mean, if we could just start broadcasting more hours and on AM frequencies, uh, I think that would mean a lot. I mean, one of the most moving things in my career was when I was in South Korea at one point, and um, I was introduced to someone who really wanted to meet me after a gathering kind of like this, and I'm like, okay, okay. Turns out it was a lady who was now a graduate student in economics in South Korea who used to listen to me. 
on Radio Free Asia. She said, you were great. You were the one we listened to because you actually explained what was going in on. Did you have in like a regular gig? Were you like no, a DJ? But they just, they just, no, they just interviewed me all the time about the economy because right. I'm the only person, right? I, it's, I'm a <laughs> monopolist, right? You want to know about the North Korean economy, you come to me. And so, so they said, no, you would explain what was going on you know, when we knew the government was lying to us. And she said, we listened to what you said. And I was just blown away. I was just doing it as a personal favor to the guy who ran the operation. I had no idea I was actually having any impact in North Korea. Right. So I would say as we should be focusing on those sorts of much more simple technologies, radio, and forms of information you can broadcast and that may be receivable on a cell phone. Right, right. I, mean, you, you I think that's a wonderful idea. In your slate piece, you talked about the Voice of America. Yeah, I, um, you know, I think uh, yeah, the, the, U, the United States has the tools. They have the tools, like Radio Fada, it has a, um, you know, is very popular in Iran, in, 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 in Dubai, and in the neighbor countries. And I think that could be like, uh, they could, you know, but it's, 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 uh, it's underfunded. Uh, the v, uh, VOA could be, a Voice of America could be like, uh, you know, if the budget of the Voice of America, however, when you uh, expand the uh, expand, uh, governmental projects, you know, it doesn't mean it's going to go a, in a, to, to, a bet, uh, to a better di direction. But uh, if it was uh, funded very well, and it, you know, the, um, uh, it was, uh, uh, it was used in a proper way. I think you know it would uh, challenge that narrative. You know, and I remember you know, like a month, a few months ago, I asked my mom that um, she lives in Tehran. She's 75 years old, and I said, you know, mommy, uh, what 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 do you watch on TV and satellites? And she said, we just, mommy, we finished uh, uh, season four, 24, and uh, <laughs> uh, what is the other one? Lost. We finished the <laughs> last, you know, just uh, the uh, seventh season or sixth season, and. Uh, so, but when I asked my mom and, and dad about uh, about the, the politics, uh -huh. so you know the version of uh, 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 like, uh, the, the, the version that they give me is the version that the Iranian TV actually provides for them. So, in my opinion, the U.S. government, you know, nobody can beat the U.S. entertainment business. You know, we don't have Britney Spears or like Lindsay Lohan or uh -huh. uh, you know uh, Hollywood or that these kind of things. But uh, the Iranian t uh, government is much more success successful to create a political narrative about the U.S. prisons in Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, about uh, you know, Guantanamo uh, prison, about Abu Ghraib, about what they have done you know, in Palestine. So their political narrative is much more stronger. It's more compelling, not, not for Iranians, for the people uh, you know, in the Middle East. So if they want to do something with that, if they want to say you know, how, what the Iranian government, what, what, what they are doing with their nuclear program, what they are doing in, uh, in Palestine, how they are you know, in, interfering in, in Syria or I mean, whatever, in Iraq or whatever the US government claims. So they have to be uh, able to challenge that narrative. And as you said, you know, there are tools that you can really reach out to many more people. With internet, uh, in, in the street case, you can reach out to like 200 people, 500 people, 5,000 people, 10,000 people. With radio, you reach out to like millions of people. And those people that are more, more and so the the, the social base of those governments, which is, I think, right. very important. So radio is the answer. That's, that's awfully retro that one for of the a answer. future one tense of the event. Answer. No, I know, <laughs> but in fairness, I w you know, there clearly uh, broadcasting and radio doesn't allow people to, to communicate with each other, which is a di kind of a different issue, but clearly it doesn't have the same complications. But, and if I could add one more thing, Cuba is very different, of course, because yes. of the connection to Florida, the TV, the, you know, the person to person. But um, it's one thing to give you know, the opponents of the regime access to the internet so they can get their, world out to the, uh, their words out to the world. But if no other Cubans are, are getting on the internet in mass numbers, right. they're still not getting their word out to other Cubans. Um, and if I had $2 million, I'd buy access cards to those internet cafes at the hotels and hand them out to the kids and say, especially when the, especially when the broadband will be in those hotels and let the young people come and start really surfing the internet. And uh, you could get a lot of hotel lots hours of, of internet for lots $2 of million. Dollars. Th these <laughs> conversations are inherently frustrating because obviously we've got three case studies here that are fascinating, each one in its own right. Each one could take a full day event. So I apologize for, for just giving you a taste of these three case studies. And we, need, we do need to move on. Can uh, I just add one point? <laughs> just, the mo just to. Uh, uh, I think that uh, some of these ideas, like the internet in the suitcase and uh, anti-proxy programming that they, you know, some companies are doing, I think these 
programs are great, but the uh, scale of the budget that the U.S. is you know putting in this uh, uh, on, the, uh, on this program, I think it's very low. And I, you know, politically speaking, I think uh, you know when it comes to politics, I think uh, it doesn't show that the U.S. is really determined to change anything in these countries. But you know, I think because of the pub public pressure, you know, organizations like uh, like like you and you know and activists and you know. Uh, uh, the civil society, they are allocating some money to these projects. But you know, if they wanted to do something, the money sh should be much bigger right. for all of these programs. And, and I encourage everybody, uh, as I said, at the end of the next session, we're going to have refreshments and a lot of the participants will be around and we can con continue having these chats. Um, now we're going to segue to our last session of the day. Um, so thank you to this panel very much. Thank you. I'm going home. <laughs> Okay. Uh, which is sort of a symbolic way of describing a lot of the government efforts to bypass the master switch and empower civil society. The, this poor suitcase has taken a real beating here today from a lot of participants. So now we actually get to hear, uh, hopefully, a defense of the suitcase. Uh, to moderate this next discussion, I am going to introduce Bob Wright, whose biography I am not finding here. But Bob Wright is a future tense fellow here at New America. He is the founder and leader of Logging Heads TV. He is the author of Non-Zero, The Evolution of God. He also is, uh, writes a column for the New York Times. Um, I have to confess. Bob doesn't know this, but I get, I get, uh, I get ribbed a lot in the office for uh, for having a bit of an intellectual crush on Bob Wright, because <laughs> every time we're discussing any kind of session, whether the topic is the, the you know where the jobs are going to be, the future of the U.S. economy, uh, what's happening in Cuba, uh, how dog behavior, uh, edu education, you name it, my first suggestion always. Well, we should have Bob Wright moderate that one. <laughs> so today we are lucky to, in fact, have Bob Wright moderating this, this great discussion. Bob? Well, thank you. Um, you have violated the first rule of introducing people, which is always lower expectations. <laughs> um, but thank you very much. Um, I have got uh, with me uh, Sasha Meinrath, who is uh, um, the director of the Open Technology Initiative here at New America. Um, and Ian Schuler, who is at the State Department, Senior Program Manager, um, Internet Freedom Programs. Um, now, the context for this discussion was set by a, a New York Times article um, on, the, I think, the front page of this, the Sunday paper a few weeks ago. I remember it well. It was called, it, it, the headline was, U.S. Underwrites Internet Detour Around Censors. Had a very arresting lead paragraph. Um, the Obama administration is leading a global effort to deploy, quote, shadow internet and mobile phone systems that dissidents can use to undermine repressive governments that seek to silence them <coughs> by censoring or shutting down telecommunications networks. But what really got my attention was the second paragraph when it, when it described, quote, one operation out of a spy novel in a fifth floor shop on L Street in Washington <laughs> where a group of young entrepreneurs who look as if they could be in a garage band are fitting deceptively innocent-looking hardware into a prototype internet in a suitcase. Now, when I read that, I really 